summary, in the context of the lay community, there are several forms of conduct that should be emphasised in relation to personal wealth. A. In terms of the individual, the Buddha specifically praised those wealthy persons who acquire their wealth through diligent effort and by righteous means, and do spend the money for wholesome, meritorious purposes. He praised virtue and benevolence over wealth itself. It is important to instill a sense of values in contemporary people so that they recognize that it is a source of pride to accumulate wealth through effort and honest means and to determine to use that wealth for doing good deeds. Praising people simply because they are wealthy by considering that they have accumulated merit from good deeds in the past and previous lifetimes and by failing to consider the causes for that wealth in this lifetime is incorrect from the perspective of Buddhism in two ways. First, it does not accord with the praise bestowed by the Buddha on those wealthy persons as mentioned above. And second, it does not involve a wise and complete assessment of causes and conditions especially the causes and conditions in the present life, which have the most direct relationship to the personal circumstances and should thus be given more importance. Past karma can only act as an initial foundation, say of providing physical attributes, mental aptitude, quickness of mind and personal disposition, which supports actions in this lifetime. Granted, past actions play an important role for being born in a wealthy family, but even here the Buddha did not mark such a fact as particularly praiseworthy, because a general principle of Buddhism is that of not glorifying or overly prizing a person's family or status of birth. The Buddha praised wholesome actions which are the causes for this individual to receive such a desirable result. Being born into a wealthy family is in itself a boon. There is no need to add to this by praise. According to Buddhism, such a birth is seen as starting capital, which gives such a person a good opportunity or even an advantage over other people in making progress in this life. The results from past actions have thus come to fruition and the, and the person has reached a new starting point. Buddha praised or criticized how such a person applies this starting capital. In general, the Buddha praised or In general, the Buddha's praise or criticism focuses on whether one generates wealth through honest, righteous means or fails to do so, and on how one then conducts oneself in relation to such wealth. The Buddha did not praise or criticize wealth itself or rich people, rather he praised or criticized rich people's behavior. B. In terms of society, Buddhism teaches that material wealth is a support for life. It is not the goal of life. Wealth should thus facilitate and prepare people for living a virtuous life and for performing good deeds in order to realize higher levels of spiritual excellence. Whatever and to whomever riches arise should benefit all human beings and be conducive to their well-being. Following this principle, when an individual becomes wealthy, all people are enriched and the entire society prospers. When a good person acquires wealth, his or her community also acquires wealth. Such a person is like a fertile field in which rice flourishes for the benefit of all. A wealthy person can feel 
satisfy and honoured to receive society's trust and to act as a delegate for society in the sharing of wealth to support and nourish fellow human beings and to provide them with an opportunity for true growth. On the contrary, if some individuals become more wealthy but society as a whole deteriorates and the suffering of other people increases, this indicates that there is an improper conduct in regard to material wealth. The generated wealth does not become a supportive factor, which is the true purpose of wealth. Before long there will be unrest in society. In the end, either the status of those wealthy members of society or the structure of society as a whole will be unsustainable. Members of the wider community may remove the wealthy and influential individuals from their positions of power and establish a new system, one with new executives for the allocation of wealth, which may be an improvement or a worsening of the situation. In any case, there exists this truth that if people conduct themselves incorrectly, in relation to material wealth, which arises for the benefit of all, wealth ends up harming and destroying human nature, human beings and human society. See, in terms of a state or a nation, Buddhism recognizes these important aspects of material wealth. Poverty is a form of suffering, poverty and Deprivation are crucial causes for crime and wrongdoing in society, as is the related factor of greed, and it is the responsibility of the state or of p political leaders to care for and allocate funds to the poor and to ensure that there are no destitute people in the, in the country. To address these issues, various measures are required, which are often specific to the circumstances. Example, to provide citizens with opportunities for making an honest living, to create jobs, to allocate funds and other means of assistance. According to the teaching on the four virtues making for national integration, Raja Sangaha Vatu, and to prevent immoral and unrighteous activities like exploitation. In this sense, the state should consider the reduction and absence of poverty as a better measurement for its success than the increase of wealthy individuals in that society. The absence of poverty is a result of social management that does not neglect the spiritual development of the people in society. D. In terms of economics and politics, it is frequently asked what sort of economic system or government is best, or government best conforms to the principles of Buddhism. Basically, this is not a question that Buddhism is required to answer, but at the risk of stating a tautology, one can respond that any system that is applied in harmony with Buddhist values and principles is valid. Economic or political systems should be analysed according to how they are practised. An analysis which changes or is modified as a result of environmental conditions related to time and place. Here it should be reiterated that the purpose and true benefit of material wealth is that it acts as a support for human beings in coordinating their lives, to enable them to live together peacefully, to perform meritorious deeds and to realise higher levels of spiritual excellence. Thus, when wealth manifests for an individual, society as a whole benefits and all people will prosper. Whichever economic or political system effectuates such a wholesome outcome is in harmony with Buddhism. 
Obvious examples of how social systems are connected to specific temporal and regional factors are the following. When the Buddha established the monastic community with its distinct task and object, he set down a discipline limiting the monks' personal possessions to the eight requisites. Other possessions belonging other possessions belong to the community as a whole. In relation to the lay community who at that time in India, Jambudipa observed two forms of governance. The Buddha taught that the conditions of prosperity of Parihaniya Dhamma for those Republican states or those states governed by a quorum and he taught the imperial observances Chakravati Vata for those states governed by a monarchy. These accounts demonstrate how Buddha Dhamma is not merely a philosophy or an abstract teaching, but rather it is a practical teaching which is connected to people active within society and to real life circumstances. The teachings need to be applicable, relevant and beneficial to people's daily life. If one waits until one is completely finished establishing a so-called ideal political system, the superiority, the superiority of which can never be conclusively proved before people are able to experience happiness and well-being. How can one escape from hypothetical notions and credulity. In the case where both republics and monarchies existed, the Buddha found ways to benefit those people living under these different political systems. In the case of a republic, the Buddha suggested ways to strengthen and secure the people's mutual endeavours. In the case of a monarchy, he encouraged the rulers to recognize that prestige and power should be tools for benefiting the people, not for self-gratification and self-indulgence. In the period of King Ashoka, when the system of monarchy reached its zenith, the king adhered to Buddhist principles of governance while ruling the country as is confirmed by the dictum carved into one of the Asokan pillars. His Majesty the Supreme Emperor, he who looks with kindness on the world, loved by the gods, does not assign great value to his own honour and prestige, unless he desires these with this object, objective in mind. Both in the present and in the future, may people listen to my instructions with devotion and practice in accord with the righteous way. When people have understood the gist and objective of the Buddhist teachings related to economics and politics, the detailed task of determining which system truly conforms to Buddhism rests with scholars of these systems to debate. Similarly, if people wish to think up new systems of governance which improve upon pre-existing ones, that is even better. These matters go beyond the preserve of this book. <coughs> Virtuous conduct and moral codes Moral codes were established to guide people's behaviour and speech. They deal with people's relationship to their external environment, especially the relationship to other human beings, and they maintain a way of life that is well ordered and mutually beneficial for all members of society. Moral codes assist people within a particular society to increase virtuous activities so that they can realize the highest goal according to their belief system and to support them in spreading their beliefs. 
activities on virtues among other groups of people. In Buddhism, the teachings which address society directly and express the spirit of Buddhist social relationships are the teachings on sila, ethics, moral conduct, virtuous conduct. The most basic moral code is not is to not harm other people, either physically or verbally, and to not impair mindfulness and clear comprehension, which protect a person's moral integrity. In Buddha Dharma, this basic moral code is most often described and embodied as the five precepts. A. Important terms pertaining to morality, Sila, Vinaya and Sika Pada. Before looking at this subject of morality more closely, we should examine some of the relevant Pali terms. Many Pali terms have various nuances of meaning, which leads to a degree of complexity. Some of these terms have been adopted into the Thai language, yet their meanings have occasionally deviated from the original meanings. Some of these terms have even taken on opposite meanings from those they originally had. These terms thus need to be constantly reviewed and re-examined. There are three primary terms relevant to this subject of moral conduct. Sila, Vinaya and Sika, Pada. On the whole, in the original Pali, the meanings of these three terms are clearly distinguished. Occasionally, these terms are used in a broad or colloquial sense and may be interchangeable. Technically speaking, however, their meanings are strictly defined and distinguished in order to avoid confusion. Here are the basic meanings of these three terms. Sila, virtuous conduct and moral rectitude expressed by way of body and speech being a collective term sila is used in the singular it is a mass noun it is not divided into sub factors vinaya an established code of behavior and practice a framework for living one's life containing rules precepts laws prescriptions etc for guiding and monitoring one's conduct in a harmonious and integrated way, leading to order, discipline, success and fulfilment. This term too is a collective term and is used in the singular. Sikapada, rules of training and practice, especially those prescribed by the Buddha, stipulating an obligation to perform an action or to refrain from an action. In order to bring about correct and righteous conduct, this term may be used either in the singular or in the plural. Combined, all the training rules of Sikapada comprise a code of discipline, Vinaya, practicing in accord with the training rules and being established in the code of discipline or conduct in harmony with the training rules and the code of discipline is referred to as moral conduct, Sila. For example, the 227 training rules for monks are called the Bhikkhu Vinaya. Those monks who uphold the Vinaya, those who follow the training rules correctly, are considered established in moral conduct. The same holds true for those Bhikkhunis who uphold the Bhikkhuni Vinaya, comprising 311 training rules. For Buddhist lay people, there are the five training rules or five precepts, Pancha Sika Buddha, beginning with abstaining from killing living creatures. Lay people who uphold these five precepts are considered established in morality. Such moral conduct is occasionally referred to as Pancha Sika Buddha Sila. These are the strict definitions as mentioned above, however, these three terms are sometimes used in a broad sense. 
in which case they may be used interchangeably. A common example of this is to refer to the five precepts, Panchasika Pada, as the five moral observances, Panchasila. This term Panchasila is used only seldom in the Tipitaka. Its use is probably for the sake of brevity. In particular in poetry in particular in poetic verses. It is used frequently in the commentaries, although the term Sikapada in this context is unfamiliar to some people. It is clearly evident in the formal verses for undertaking the precepts. When the term Sila is used to replace Sikapada, the two can be used in the plural, comprising various training rules or precepts. Its meaning is thus expanded beyond the moral character of those who behave correctly according to a code of discipline or a set of precepts. In the original Pali, the term Vinaya was a very important term with many nuances of meaning. For example, it represents a key system of conduct paired with the term Dhamma in the compound Dhamma Vinaya. Many of this term's nuances lie outside of the triad mentioned above of Sila Vinaya and Sika Pada. At least in the Thai language pronounced Vinai, its meaning has become rather ambiguous and imprecise. And even in Buddhist circles, the term Vinaya is used as a vague and imprecise way. In Thailand, the term Vinaya is frequently used in the context of business activities and other everyday enterprises. In this context, however, its meaning is greatly restricted, referring to self-control, disciplined constraint, um, adherence to rules and regulations, etc. For example, in the expression traffic discipline, Vinay Jara Jong, Vinaya Jara Chara, the term Vinay has thus developed the meaning pertaining to a person's attributes, namely to a steadfastness in self control and an ability to follow specific rules and principles. Here its meaning begins to overlap with that of Sila. A split appears to have occurred in the monasteries or in relation to religious matters. People use the term Sila in Thai pronounced Sin, while in relation to mundane matters, people use the term Vinaya. This is true even though both of these terms are vital to the Buddhist teachings. When Buddhists include the monks, when Buddhists, including the monks, become estranged from the essence of the Dhamma Vinaya, their understanding of relevant terms becomes obscured. Of the three terms mentioned above, Sila, which refers to the moral conduct, moral character of an individual is the aim and purpose of the other two terms. Spiritual training in line with precepts and guided by a code of discipline is intended to generate moral integrity in people. Eventually the term Sila has been used to encompass the meanings of all three of these terms. The terms Vinaya and Sikapada remain behind the scene, and the term Sila, becoming an umbrella term, has also become vague. Moral conduct is the first factor in the threefold training, Tiso Sika, whereby one cultivates moral integrity, Adi Sila Sika, power of the mind, Adi Chita Sika, and wisdom, Adi Panya Sika. This is a matter of individual spiritual training. For individual people, 
and indeed the entire world to exist in a state of well-being, one must provide a suitable training for people in order for them to be spiritually accomplished. This training begins with individuals who are then actively engaged in society. A closer look at this process of training, however, reveals that spiritual development requires an ability to relate to other people in society. Everyone is engaged in specific social activities, which may assist at all levels of spiritual development. From cultivating the sense basis to cultivating wisdom, people are also engaged in managing their physical environments, allocating the four requisites and other material things, eating, earning a livelihood, governance, etc. All of these activities pertain to the concept of Vinaya. Although Vinaya is grouped alongside Sila, it has a distinct scope or boundary. These terms cannot be used interchangeably and should not be used for one another. These explanations are intended to act as a foundation for this discussion of moral conduct. A clear understanding of these relevant terms will assist in this matter and will help to avoid confusion.